Previously on Transformers University, we talked about the wealth of media and publications around the Transformers brand in 1985. And finally, we wrap up with just one more set of tales. Six audiobooks dissected right now for you on Transformers University. Hello, my friend, and welcome to episode 42 of Transformers University. I am your host, Anthony Brucali, owner, operator, madman behind tfu.info, the website, the toy archive, and all the social media that goes along with it. And I want to thank you for joining me today on Transformers University. And today we are winding down 1985, and there's been a lot that ground that we have covered, and uh, there's not much ground left to cover, and I'm very, very happy about that because 86 is going to be fun, and I'm looking forward to getting into that. But uh, we do have a few more things to do, a few more T's to cross and I's to dot in 1985. And today we are talking about uh, a series of audiobooks, uh, actually a couple of different audiobooks, but one called uh, The Battle for Planet Earth, uh, done by uh, Pickwick, which is a company out of the UK. And we're going to talk about uh, two books, both with the same title, both audiobooks called Sun Raid, uh, and both of those two entirely different stories. Now, before we jump into it, just a quick reminder and a quick thank you. We just, uh, here in the US, we just had Thanksgiving, so I want to give thanks for my Patreon supporters over at patreon.com slash tfuinfo. That's P-A-T-R-E-O-N dot com slash tfuinfo. Uh, over there, you could have heard this show a whole 24 hours ahead of schedule, uh, at the very least. Uh, plus, you get access to all sorts of exclusive content. So I want to thank my Patreon donors as well. And uh, if you'd like to sign up, please swing on by, help out the show. Uh, be greatly appreciated. Now, on to the Pickwick books, Battle for Planet Earth. Uh, Battle for Planet Earth. No the in there. Um couple things worth noting here so this is actually an audiobook in four parts so I'm gathering that it was a double cassette set and then each side of the cassette had a story uh, parts one two three and four now the stories uh, don't interlink but they do reference each other on occasion the cover art on this cassette set was the uh, 19 19- 84 uh, box art from the back of the box, the battle scene that uh, it's fairly well known. It was used for a ton of merch. Uh, It's painted by a gentleman by the name of David Schleinkoffer. And uh, we'll talk a little bit more about him later on in this episode. But that art is what graces the cover of this series of audiobooks. And the audiobooks here are narrated and voiced by one man. That is Peter Marinker. Now, Peter Marinker, uh, also the narrator on the Lady Bird storybooks which we covered back in episode 38 interesting to note that peter marinker is still acting today uh most recently and probably most notably and on a show i have not yet watched season two of uh, i believe they're on season three or four and that is into the badlands on amc uh he played a character by the name of doc cloud in season two now on to part one on the battle for planet earth and that one is entitled terror of mount sheila now interesting note here unlike a lot of the audiobooks this does not have a new theme song it is the same theme song that we heard in the ladybird books and again back in episode 38 you'll be able to hear that we start out finding out about the autobots uh, still looking to rebuild the ark and they end up in South America with uh, two human guides, John and Tim Gordon. Uh, Marinker, as a voice actor here, um, occasionally tries to impersonate the uh, cartoon voice actors uh, badly, <laughs> and then occasionally goes off in some very bizarre directions. And we'll talk about that uh, as the Autobots find a volcano. And Jazz here is either a bad John Travolta impression, a bad Bob Dylan impression, or a bad John Lennon impression. I haven't really put it together. Give a listen. So that's a volcano, said Jazz. 
I know a volcanic eruption was responsible for our release, but I didn't know what an actual volcano looked like. All right, now, hold up. <laughs> the Autobots don't know what a volcano is. They live in a volcano. And the weirdness doesn't end here. Uh, there's this odd exchange between Tim and Optimus Prime. Tim nodded, then said, Optimus, I have a funny feeling this is going to erupt soon. That would be wonderful. Optimus Prime replied. Then we can see at first hand the available power, and if there is any way it can be harnessed for our uses. Now, the Decepticons are spying on the Autobots observing the volcano. Uh, Laserbeak returns and hands off some information, and there's a bit of an odd error. See if you pick it up. He transformed into his other disguise as an audio cassette. Sound Warp slotted the cassette into his own playback system, and they all listened to Laserbeak's observations. And the Decepticons, including Sound Warp, <laughs> or Sound Wave, or Sky Warp, they do a lot of talking and planning about the volcano. Almost two minutes worth of talking and planning about the volcano. Before they uh, finally decide to attack the volcano at its crater, and uh, they miss the Autobots for the most part, and then... They decide to do a bit more planning. Uh, the Decepts' plan here is to pick off the Autobots one by one from a distance. In the meantime, John and Tim, they want to get off this mountain. Uh, they have, I guess, a bad feeling about the mountain. And Optimus Prime orders a retreat down to the other side of the mountains. The Decepticons take over Mount Sheila just as the volcano erupts. And the Decepticons are defeated by lava. So if you're keeping score at home, that's uh, Volcano 1, Decepticons 0. And that takes us to part 2 of this series, and that is Bumblebee to the rescue. Uh, we find out Mount St. Hillary is in uh, Arvin's mountain range, and the Autobots are hanging at the Ark, just watching some TV. A picture was shown of a small town, a town of perhaps 10,000 inhabitants. Its streets were almost empty except for a few elderly people and children. They all looked in a state of shock. The newscaster was speaking over the pictures. And so the mystery of the disappearing population of this small town continues. Every able-bodied man and woman have completely vanished overnight. Even the police have gone. The state governor has ordered an immediate investigation. So the Decepticons abducted an entire town. Uh, so what do the Autobots do? They decide to plan. And plan. <laughs> and plan. Uh, Bumblebee wants to go on a spy mission, so much so that he even quotes his own textbook motto. You know my motto? The least likely to be the most dangerous. Another interesting note here, something that uh, we see a lot with the coloring books, is that uh, they mention that Bumblebee has a great, quote, range of vision. Uh, Bumblebee's job is to observe Decepticon headquarters. And uh, during that observation, another mention of his great vision. Finally, he infiltrates the headquarters. Uh, the humans have been uh, kidnapped there and are enslaved, working for the Decepticons. And Bumblebee is hiding behind a computer, which he then recognizes as a very important piece of equipment. It was a vital piece of equipment, which the Decepticons had salvaged from their landing on Earth all those years ago. The Autobots had similar equipment themselves. It was a computer which controlled molecular motion, whereby the visitors from Cybertron were able to adapt to the conditions of temperature and moisture on Earth. Without the computer working accurately, they would ultimately slowly perish through their inability to equate with the Earth's environment. Wow. So there is a computer basically keeping the Decepticons as a group alive. <laughs> um... This is weird, a weird piece of technology that I don't think is ever really addressed uh, again or anywhere else because really this should be uh, individually and internally managed per Decepticon. But Bumblebee sabotages the computer by removing a crystal from the inside which will then cause the computer to fail within 28 days. Uh, Bumblebee escapes and the Decepticons uh, see him and search for him but do not find him. He gets back to the Ark and Prime decides to use the crystal as a bargaining chip to get the humans back. Now, wait a minute, wait a minute. So, Prime has this crystal in his hand that would 
wipe out the Decepticons in four weeks. All he's got to do is wait the four weeks, and all the Decepticons will just die. And he decides to give it back to them? Uh, that's a terrible plan. That's a terrible, terrible, T-R-B-L, terrible. That was a terrible, terrible plan. But the Decepticons realize that they're in grave peril, um, and they accept the offer. Uh, they return the humans. Uh, they wipe their memories, which I thought was weirdly interesting. And that's how that story ends. Now, on to part three. Menace at the Dam, a Transformers adventure that takes place at a dam. <laughs> You know, <laughs> you know, I find it funny that uh, this damn motif, this damn motif keeps coming back uh, to haunt us on this show. And I know for a fact it's not the last time we're going to see Transformers fight over a dam. So uh, just mark this onto the list of fights at a dam. Now, the Decepticons, um, they don't know what hydroelectric power is. Um and Ravage has to explain it to them. A hydroelectric power station generates electricity using the energy of falling water. The water turns a turbine connected to an alternator. It's a very simple method of creating power, which if you knew your history, you would remember we once used on Cybertron, way, way back in the mists of time, when we were not much more advanced in scientific matters than these stupid Earth people are here now. Cybertron had dams? Cool. Um, apparently it was so damn long ago, though, that no one else remembers them. Um, the Decepticons head out, and Windcharger was spying on them, reports back, and the Autobots investigate what is uh, called Stanley Lake Dam. Uh, the Decepticons are about to enter the dam, but... Suddenly, they all heard a noise from just nearby. A sound like a high-powered motorbike. Every Decepticon turned, ready for action. Sounds like an Autobot, snapped Rumble. They can't know we are here, said Megatron. What is it then, demanded Starscream. I can hear another sound too, said Soundwave, whose hearing talent far surpassed the others. Then he called, Come out, you idiot! That's not funny! It dawned on Megatron first. It's Skywarp again, playing his foolish pranks. Oh, that's Skywarp and his pranks. Actually, that is a reference to the uh, tech spec text on his uh, toy. Uh, so that's a neat callback. And might be one of the few, if not the only time, uh, that's actually done. Now, the Decepticons enter the building office and uh, demand the engineers there to explain how the dam works. The lead engineer refuses. And Rumble, not sure which color this one is. Pick your favorite. Um... He continues his murder spree that uh, we talked about uh, back during the Key to Vector Sigma. Throw him out, snapped Megatron. Rumble, throw him in the lake. Rumble, always anxious to please his leader, grabbed the man roughly and tossed him through the window. They all heard the splash as he went into the cold water. Or did he? Uh, turns out the human survives and um, meets the Autobots as he washes ashore. The Autobots decide to draw the Decepticons out uh, by attacking the dam. And the Decepticons head out. And then back at the control office, uh, Jazz and the humans unleash the power of the dam on the Decepticons, washing them away. So, keeping score again at home, Volcano 1, Dam 1, Decepticon 0. And that takes us to part four of the battle for planet Earth. That one is entitled Espionage. Actually, there are five exclamation points at the end of Espionage. So let's say that properly. Espionage! Um, so in this one, say it with me. Go for it. <laughs> in this one, just make sure you say all five exclamation points whenever you refer to the episode. Uh this one starts with a recap of the last three episodes if you uh, decided to start on tape two, side two. And the Decepticons, not happy that they keep losing. They realize they need to use espionage to uh, 
win against the Autobots. So uh, Starscream plans to spy by pretending to be an Autobot. Uh, he does this and meets with the Autobots. Uh, the Autobots figure out his plan, but play along anyway to set a trap. Another odd thing in this series, and particularly this episode, uh, the narrator keeps referring to the Autobots and Decepticons as races, uh, which is kind of weird, because that means this is like a race war, and that's really not <laughs> something uh, I think that really fits to what they are. They're not really races as much as they are factions, right? Prime tells Starscream of his new weapon, the... Derudium Orbital Laser Tracing System. That's right. The Derudium Orbital Laser Tracing System. D-O-L-T-S. A.K.A. DOLTS. Uh, <laughs> Starscream reports about the D-O-L-T-S to Megatron. The Decepticons then attack uh, Mount Leverum, where Optimus said the D-O-L-T-S was being stored and uh while the decepticons are away attacking mount leverum the autobots are attacking decepticon headquarters uh the base is destroyed as the decepticons realize that there's nothing in mount leverum can come back and find uh their home a smoldering mess and then uh, optimus decides to free starscream send him back to the decepticons but not before rubbing in a little bit about the fake MacGuffin. Hey, you, Starscream. Not only was there never such a weapon as a D-O-L-T-S, but did you know that the Earth people have a word spelt that way? Dolts. Means a bunch of idiots or fools. We named it after the Decepticons. Good luck, Starscream. And uh, that wraps up the battle for planet Earth. I uh, gotta say, uh, there's a reason why this one is a little uh, bit unremembered and unrevered, because it is pretty boring. Um, it's a boring listen. It's not even really terribly fun for stupidity's sake. Um, there are a few things here and there, but uh, unlike, say, the uh, uh, the Satellite of Doom, which we covered way back, uh, there is not enough here to make you want to listen to the whole thing so uh much like you know some parents tell their kids i work so you don't have to uh i'm telling you my dear students i listen to this so you don't have to but if you do want to listen to this one or if you want to listen to the next two stories we're about to talk about uh, there's a great YouTube channel called Retro Robot Radio. I've been giving them a shout out because uh, that's where all this audio is from. And uh, you should swing on by and check them out. They have all of these on YouTube uh, to listen to for free. Now, moving on, we're going to talk about two stories with the same title, kind of in the same format, being that they're both audiobooks. Uh, written by two different people, <laughs> and both out in 1985. And that is a story, or a pair of stories, I should say, called Sun Raid. Now, the first Sun Raid story we're going to talk about uh, came with a book from uh, the brand Color Forms. Now, it was uh, under the Listen and Play uh, series, and it was written by a man that went by the name of Dr. Z. Uh, I cannot find much on this guy other than the fact that he wrote other similar Color Forms books. Now, Color Forms, if you are unfamiliar with the concept, it's actually kind of neat uh, play pattern. So there are, uh, in this case, blank pages on the book, and there are stickers that are removable uh, that you can place around the book to kind of uh, recreate the scenes in the story or make up your own adventures. The cover art for this book... Uh, is by the aforementioned David Schleinkoffer, who uh, did the 84 box back, also did uh, this pretty sweet image of um, a 747 with Skywarp transforming and about to land on its wing, and uh, Starscream and Thundercracker flying below it. If you want to check it out, check out the TF Wiki entry for this story, and uh, at the very bottom is a link to Mr. Schleinkoffer's 
own personal Flickr account where you can find this photo without the title on it and uh, you kind of see it in its full glory. Uh, it's pretty, pretty nice. Now, the color forms that were included uh, in this, for the most part, were just the Transformers toy box art uh, as color form stickers. And that was uh, Optimus, Megatron, Jazz, Hound, Skids, Ratchet, Gears, Starscream, Skywarp, Soundwave, Rumble, and Frenzy. So feel free to apply whichever color you feel each one is. Sideswipe, Sunstreaker, Trailbreaker, and Bombshell. Uh, also included were a human in a jumpsuit which we'll later find out is a gentleman by the name of Steve and Jazz in vehicle mode, uh, which is from the back cover of this book, which I'm going to assume was also painted by David Schleinkoffer. And um, the back cover <laughs> it's a little weird as well because it really looks like Jazz ran over uh, the human in the jumpsuit. Every time you hear this sound, It means it's time to turn to the next page. So the story starts out with a hot day in the desert. Jazz is driving around, rocking out. Before his music is interrupted by a broadcast. We interrupt your regular radio program with this special news bulletin. Repeat, this is a special news bulletin. Government officials today confirm that airline passenger planes have mysteriously disappeared from major airports across the nation. These planes, each carrying several hundred passengers, were last seen at roughly 1,900 feet above the airports. At this point, according to one official, the planes seem to vanish and cannot be detected by radar. Experts have concluded that the technology necessary to make these planes disappear is far too advanced for ordinary terrorists. Okay, so this is not your ordinary terrorists. Uh, makes me wonder what exactly are ordinary terrorists uh do we have the run-of-the-mill terrorists in this world who are just uh hanging out day to day and then uh you're not so ordinary terrorists who are stealing airplanes now as he's driving jazz finds a uh, passed out human on the road uh we will later find out his name is steve as jazz rescues him and takes him back to base uh steve meets the autobots and the autobots figure out the decepticons plan kidnapping humans to then ransom and exchange for energy as part of their deception and part of the next phase of their plan the decepticons decide to encase starscream in the shell of a passenger jet so they are welding a 747 body around starscream <laughs> to capture more humans uh, the autobots find the decepticon warehouse and attack while the planes are away and free the humans rumble pick your color uh is defeated uh, as he is the one to guarding the humans the decepticon jets return and realize it's a trap with the autobots uh awaiting them and a battle ensues starscream trapped in his shell cannot do anything he can't fire his weapons and he can't transform uh and the decepticons are defeated and uh flee and thus the autobots uh Optimus Jazz, alongside of Steve, ruminate on Starscream's predicament, being trapped in a shell. But you know, I almost felt sorry for that guy, Starscream. Imagine being unable to transform. No worse thing could ever happen to a member of our race. That Starscream, he wasn't nothing but a lean, mean flying machine with no beam. Someone must have goofed and used two out of welding gun on that metal disguise. And that's how Starscream got trapped inside. It just goes to show, or what goes to show, you are what you heat. So from the listen and play sun raid, we move on now to the listen and fun sun raid. Um, that title, listen and fun, um, fun is not a verb, you cannot listen and then go and fun um so <laughs> um so when you listen to this please go fun go fun yourself uh this one this version of sun raid was a cassette package with a cliff jumper toy either red or yellow um and actually sealed versions of this go for a pretty penny on uh ebay and the secondary market now the story starts with cliff jumper reporting to Optimus about a Decepticon attack 
on a power plant in two days. Uh, Optimus explains the Autobots are low on fuel and will need to find their own source of power before defending against the Decepticons. We learn about Dr. Heath Bladesdale uh, as she receives uh, a medal from the President of the United States uh, because she has developed a solar reactor that will end uh, the energy crisis of the 80s and uh, end the United States' reliance on nuclear power. Megatron sees this broadcast and decides to uh, cancel the attack in place for an attack on the solar reactor. Cliffjumper, he needs to find Dr. Blaisdell, and uh, he rolls up on her. She thinks he's a person named Cliff uh, until he transforms. Uh, they argue a bit, and then he takes her against her will. I know Optimus Prime will not approve of this, but desperate Autobots do desperate things. Let me go, you kidnapping robot! Cliff Jumper transformed into a red truck. I mean, let me go, you criminal scientist stealing truck! If you will just get in, then I won't have to kidnap you! Ravage, he sees all this and decides to attack Cliff Jumper. Ravage transformed into a panther and leapt onto the cab of the red truck. They fight. And Ravage. Ravage transformed into a robot. Ravage was a panther and turned into a robot. Um, okay. <laughs> Cliffjumper eventually uh, defeats Ravage and takes the good doctor to meet Optimus Prime. Uh, Windcharger informs them that the Decepticons are about to attack the solar reactor. The Autobots show up there and fend off the attack against the Decepticon jets. Uh, and in their losing effort, Megatron radios them to retreat. Attention all Decepticons! Retreat from the reactor! I do not want it damaged! Get away from there, Starscream! Now! The Autobots, they refuel off that reactor, but the Decepticons, they regroup, and they attack the Autobot uh, defense of the solar reactor, but without Starscream, who has been punished by Megatron for defying orders and attacking the reactor without him. Uh, the Dinobots and Cliffjumper go after Megatron to stop him from reaching the solar reactor, but uh, Cliffjumper runs out of fuel just as he helps disarm Megatron. The Dinobots then uh, attack Megatron, Thundercracker, and Skywarp to defeat him just before the other Autobots arrive and observe poor Cliffjumper. Good jumper. Take Dr. Blaisdell to safety. I can't move. I'm out of fuel. This isn't the first time you've run out of fuel in the heat of battle. We'll talk about it later. Oh, cliff jumper. Uh, you are going to get a talking to. I guarantee it. Uh, the Decepticons then retreat. The reactor is destroyed in the battle. And then Prime and Cliff Jumper have their talk about running out of fuel. And that just about ends the story. Uh, and we head out on a new theme song. And that ends the listen and play and listen and fun. Did you go fun? Uh, stories, both called Sun Raid. And an interesting thing about these cassettes were the story itself was contained on side one, and on side two, uh, the cassette was blank for you to record your own story. And somewhere, there are a bunch of great tapes of kids doing ridiculous stories. Probably not too much worse than the one on side one, on side two. So, that wraps up another episode of Transformers University. I am your host, Anthony Bricali. Once again, if you want to get in touch with me, uh, the best place to do it is Twitter at TFU underscore info. Of course, you can catch us on Facebook, facebook.com slash TFU info, Instagram, username TFU info, and of course, on the Patreon, patreon.com slash TFU info. And of course, if you want to help the show in another way, it's the holiday season. You got some Christmas shopping to do, some holiday shopping to do, some Hanukkah shopping to do, uh, whatever your holiday may be. Swing on by to tfu.info slash Amazon. That will take you to Amazon.com and anything you buy from there on out, uh, Amazon throws a few cents back towards tfu.info. Next time on the show, we are going to wrap up Season 2 of the original cartoon. 
got five episodes left and we will talk about them all when we come back to Transformers University. See ya.